Good afternoon. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Joining us from Washington, D.C. today is Merve Tahiroğlu, who is a research associate at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Good afternoon, Merve. Good to have you here again. Hi, thanks for having me. So let's start with Erdogan's recent remarks. We've just heard them in the previous news video. He said that the F-35 um, fighter aircrafts, um, this project uh, would collapse with the exclusion of uh, Turkey. First of all, would you say that this is um, technically correct? Correct. Perhaps you wouldn't know, but what we're asking for here uh, right now is uh, the expert views on this matter. Is this a realistic remark in your opinion? So it definitely has a certain grain of truth in it because Turkey is a very big um, a part of the, um, F, uh, the F-35 production project. Um, it's it's in part of the uh, co-production um, uh, aspects of this entire program. So it would indeed be very difficult um, for the program to proceed, um, especially and meet its, its production deadlines and rollout deadlines um, without Turkey. But that said, a lot of the production um, is already complete. For example, the, the, the planes that Turkey itself is supposed to buy are have already um, uh, been produced. Um, and The, the most important thing we, we don't know to what extent uh, Turkey is actually part uh, Turkey is actually actually part of the production because we don't have those official numbers. But what we do know is that last year, Congress asked uh, this, the um, Defense Department to uh, for a report on reviewing what it would mean to, to in fact, remove Turkey from the F-35 program. And that report seems to have concluded that it wouldn't, in fact, derail the program, even though it would uh, cost the program quite a bit. Now, Congress has asked the State Department to, to come up with a follow-up Uh, report to the Defense Department's report, and we will see that this fall when they come when they um, uh, disclose it um, to the public. But it seems to be that it's the Pentagon's assessment that it is in fact possible to remove Turkey from the program uh, without actually derailing the program. Mm -hmm. So to paint a uh, general picture of the F-35 versus S-400 showdown that Ankara currently faces. Could you explain the main factors why um, Turkey found itself in this position? Why is Turkey stuck between uh, Moscow and Washington? And how did things get to this level in the first place? Right. Well, this is because of the um, S-400 missile defense system. Uh, Turkey has been toying with this idea of buying a, a non-NATO uh, missile defense system. In 2013 to 2015, it was um, considering buying these Chinese systems. Since 2017, Erdogan has been intent uh, on buying the S-400s from Russia. Um, uh, at first, uh, a lot of analysts considered this uh, a bargaining uh, move, a negotiating move. Um, for the Turkish side, um, for Turkey to, uh, you know, use these um, arguments that is going to buy uh, this non-NATO equipment to get a better deal um, for the Patriot defense system, which is a NATO equipment. Um, and until this day, there are still analysts out there who argue that Turkey is still engaged in these negotiations and the entire um, rhetoric on the S-400, the deal being a, a you know, quote-unquote done deal, as Erdogan said, Um, is in fact still um, uh, just to help Turkey's negotiating position and to get better terms, um, effectively a cheaper deal for the Patriot system. But at the same time, the S-400s are due to be delivered this July. So this is Uh, the, the, the deadline on this is increasing, is tightening. Um, we're reaching the end uh, here. In July, uh, some rumors suggest that uh, President Trump is supposed to go to Turkey. Um, what if the S-400s have already arrived by then? Uh, then the United States will have to make a decision about whether it's going to actually impose sanctions on Turkey uh, based on CATSA legislation that, that prohibits states from uh, uh, engaging in major deals with Russia's defense sector. So it's not legislation uh, that is focused on Turkey, but Turkey would in fact uh, have to bear the costs of it. Uh, and Erdogan has been asking for a waiver on that. But we're looking at a very tight timeline here. It's basically between now and July that we're going 
to know whether Turkey is in fact going to receive the S-400s, operate them, and whether the United States is going to respond by um, uh, imposing sanctions on Turkey, uh, and in addition to that, what will happen with the F-35 program. But it looks like the United States is very clear that if the S-400s are delivered in Turkey, Turkey will be removed of the F-35 program, and the F-35s will not be delivered to Turkey. Mm -hmm. And um, as you've also uh, probably followed yourself very closely, James Jeffrey, the U.S. Special Envoy for uh, Syria, was in Ankara this week along with um, uh, Washington's Special Envoy, Joel Rayburn, to hold talks regarding uh, a possible safe zone in Syria and to discuss efforts to find a political solution, uh, a political settlement in the country. What were the main outcomes of, of these talks and how do you evaluate them? So, these talks have been ongoing for many months, uh, in fact, years now. Uh, Turkey has been pushing for this safe zone, in fact, since the very beginning of the Syrian civil war. Um, but it has uh, increased uh, its demands that this zone be established um, since its two operations, its own two operations in Syria, Euphrates Shield and, and uh, Operation Olaf Branch. Um, basically, Turkey wants to uh, uh, break the U.S. relationship with the, y with the YPG which is a major part of, uh, the dominant part of the SDF force that the United States is engaged with in Syria. Uh, and this is why it wants to see the, the, the safe zone. Um, here's a problem with that. Uh, even when the Americans do talk to Turkey and say that, okay, we can we can establish a particular zone, perhaps it can be five miles. At first, Turkey wanted a 32-kilometer a one. They were saying it might be a 20, there might be a 20-mile zone. Then it became a five or three to five-mile zone. Um, now we're essentially looking, Americans are essentially looking um, uh, to, to get Turkey to accept a, a just a, a, a corridor rather than um, a, a zone that it would be um, uh, con administering or controlling um, that is that would be akin to the, the Euphrates Shield zone, for example. So either way, it's going to be really hard um, for the United States um, proposals on this uh, three to five mile or, or even 20 mile safe zone to actually satisfy Turkey unless the United States really disengages from Syria and disengages from the SDF. And right now we're looking at uh, statements coming out of America American officials saying we're going to be in Syria for the long haul. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't suggest that the the U.S. partnership with the SDF is over, and it doesn't suggest that realistically that the U.S. partnership with the YPG is is over. So even if uh, Turkey is a if Turkey can get this uh, safe zone the way Americans and the SDF, all, all three parties agree to this, it's not going to really satisfy Turkey's um, uh, political demands from the Americans. So it will be interesting to see how Ankara responds uh, to, to these ongoing negotiations about the safe zone um, in relation with the S-400 deal, because there seems to be some uh, negotiations surrounding all of these aspects, and we don't actually know what the outcome is going to be. But I I think uh, the statements coming out of Ankara with regards to any safe zone deal um, will be very interesting to see in conjunction with the S-400s. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, Marve, uh, we're told by official statements from both countries that the main purpose of Jeffrey's visit was to talk Syria, basically. Yet we also know that President Erdogan had a phone conversation with US President Trump on Monday uh, regarding Turkey's purchase of the Russian S-400 air defense systems. So my question to you uh, would be, would it be feasible to uh, perhaps think of a possible link between these two interactions which otherwise seem isolated? Yes, there are actually multiple issues at play right now between, because we're talking about uh, uh, uh problems on the bilateral, in the bilateral relationship on several fronts here, with the S-400s, with the safe zone in Syria. There's also the fact, let's not forget, that um, just yesterday, just on, on, on May 2nd, uh, the, the United States lifted the, the waivers it gave to Turkey and other countries, um, uh, exemptions essentially, on the Iran sanctions, which allowed Turkey and these other countries to continue importing oil from Iran, although at reduced levels. Uh, so that has expired now. 
And all of these countries, including Turkey, are expected by Washington to replace their oil um, supplies from uh, uh, that, that are coming from Iran. Uh, we've heard the Turkish foreign minister say very clearly yesterday, and it is very true, that it will be hard for Turkey to diversify away from it. Iran is one of its biggest uh, oil importers. Um, uh, and now Turkey is looking to potentially uh, additional supplies coming in from Iraq uh, to be able to uh, diversify that because uh, the United States is looking at Saudi Arabia and UAE and its Gulf partners to effectively um, take over the oil production to kind of offset um, uh, what, what the supply is um, coming from Iran, what, what sanctions do to those supplies coming from Iran. But Turkey, of course, doesn't have positive relations with these kind of, with these Gulf partners, so it doesn't want to buy that. So um, there, there are all these things that, that, that make room for negotiation between the United States and Turkey. Um, I'm sure part of the conversations uh, on Syria, of course, include the S-400s and the potential sanctions on Turkey that we're expecting because of the S-400s, but also questions about Turkey's oil supplies, how it's going to diversify, if it's going to actually comply with the with the oil sanctions on Iran, or if it's going to try try to evade them or defy them in some way. Um, I, I'm sure these are all parts of it. The problem is um, we don't really know much about it. The public statements that are coming out are not um, uh, very informative for us. So, uh, like, as I said, the, the, the timeline on all of these issues is, is very tight. So we will see um, in, the, in, the, in the coming weeks um, exactly uh, what the discussions have yielded, if they have yielded anything. Thank you very much, Marve, for your comments and for being with us again today. Thank you for having me. Bye. This week, we were joined by Marve Tahiroğlu, and she answered our questions regarding the latest in Turkey-US relations. And now we'll continue with our next news video. The International Workers' Day, also known as May Day, was marked by tens of thousands in rallies organized by labor unions, NGOs, and political parties across Turkey. An application to hold a mass rally in Istanbul's iconic and historically important Taksim Square was denied by the governorship. But unions, chambers and left-wing parties called on their members to attend celebrations at an open marketplace in the city's Bakırköy district. The rally, which brought together tens of thousands, was organized by the Confederation of Progressive Trade Unions, the Confederation of Public Sector Trade Unions, the Union of Chambers of Turkish Engineers and Architects, and the Turkish Medical Association. Meanwhile, the police said they detained 137 people in Istanbul on Wednesday for trying to hold illegal demonstrations in various parts of the city, including the central districts of Beşiktaş, Şişli, and Beyoğlu. Squares belong to the people. They cannot be closed off. Long live May 1st. Protesters shouted as police hauled them away, covering their mouths. According to the Interior Ministry, over 300,000 people participated in the 138 legal May Day events around Turkey on Wednesday. Protests for May Day, the international workers' holiday, are an annual occurrence in Turkey and have in the past been characterized by police action against demonstrators. Protests have often centered on Taksim Square, where 34 people were killed during demonstrations on May 1, 1977. Turkish, Turkey's biggest labor confederation, also held a rally in the industrial province of Kocaeli, with banners warning the government against the plans to change the severance payment regulations. The rally in the southeastern province of Şanlıurfa, organized by the Memur San, was called off after a tragic traffic accident. At least five people were killed and 13 others were injured when a bus carrying workers crashed into a car on the Birecik Suruç Highway. The workers on the bus were en route to Şanlıurfa to mark the May Day, officials said. Meanwhile, politicians also celebrated the day with messages. I would like to commemorate May 1st, Labor and Solidarity Day for all our workers who work and produce with labor and sweat, contribute to the development of our country, and I hope this day will consolidate our unity and solidarity, Presidential Communications Director Fahrettin Altun tweeted. Main opposition Republican People's Party CHP leader sent a message to his supporters for the occasion. I commemorate May 1st Labor and Solidarity Day with belief in the future that unemployment is resolved, business crime ends, Poverty and inequality in income distribution is corrected, and the future that is based on production and job opportunities, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu tweeted. May Day first emerged as an event commemorating the labor of workers worldwide on May 1, 1886, when a group of workers in the U.S. held a massive strike for an eight-hour workday. Turkey's first official May Day celebrations were held in 1923. 
On Wednesday, Turkey's central bank kept the country's year-end inflation forecasts at 14.6%. On Wednesday, Turkey's central bank kept the country's year-end inflation forecast at 14.6% this year, 8.2% next year, and 5.4% in 2021. The inflation rate will fluctuate between 12.1% and 17.2% through the end of this year. The bank's governor, Murat Çetinkaya, told a news conference in Istanbul to release the bank's quarterly inflation reports, saying that the improvements in the current account balance will continue in the coming days, and the partial recovery in economic activity was seen in the first quarter. Order, Chetinkaya added, we project the inflation rate will stabilize at 5% in the medium term under a tight monetary policy stance and enhanced policy coordination. The bank increased its food inflation forecast to 16% for 2019, up from 13% in the previous reports. Chetinkaya noted, food inflation next year is expected to reach 11%, he said. Czech football player Joseph Soral was killed on Monday after the minibus carrying Alanya Sport players crashed on its way back from a match. Josef Sural, a striker for Turkish football club Alliance Sport and the Czech national team, died at the hospital where he and six of his teammates were taken after the crash on Monday. The club's chairman has since claimed that the accident was a result of the driver falling asleep at the wheel, with police investigating the fatal crash. Seven Alliance Sport players had rented a VIP minibus to return from the club's 1-1 draw against Kayseri Sport on Sunday, when their vehicle crashed around 5 kilometers away from the southern coastal town of Alanya. Club chairman Hasan Çavuşoğlu said the driver had fallen asleep behind the wheel of the minibus. A second driver was also asleep at the time. According to the information I received from our police chief, although there were two drivers present on the vehicle, they were both asleep. The crash happened as a result of them both being asleep, Çavuşoğlu said. Joseph Sural had joined Alliance Sport from Sparta Prague in January. He played 20 times for his country after making his international debut in 2013, which included appearing at Euro 2016, scoring once in the 3-2 qualifier victory over the Netherlands in October 2015. He held a prolific record in the Czech First League, scoring 30 times in 113 appearances for Liberec and 20 times in 67 appearances with Sparta Prague. For the first time in history, two Turkish clubs will play against each other in the EuroLeague Final Four, guaranteeing a spot in the final match for a Turkish team. Anadolu Efes is headed to the Final Four for the first time in 18 years after disposing of Barcelona Lassa 80-71 in Wednesday evening at Sinan Erdem Dome in Game 5 of their Best of 5 EuroLeague Playoff Series. FS will join crosstown rival Fenerbahce Beko in Vitoria Gastes, marking the first time Turkey is represented with two teams in the event. The two Istanbul clubs will clash in the semifinals, guaranteeing a Turkish team in the Final Four final for the fourth year in a row. After 18 years, we are at the Final Four, FS coach Ergin Ataman said after the game. I am proud of my players. I am proud of all Turkish fans. Around 17,000 supporters in here. Many people could not come because there were no more tickets. I am sure everybody was in front of their televisions, he said. The coach said they have a tough task at hand in the Final Four semifinal against Fenerbahce. That's all from this week in Turkey. Thanks for tuning in and hope to see you again next Friday at 5 p.m. Goodbye.